good morning. Uh, so I've marked it as the March 25th lecture on Carmen Canvas as well. So let's begin. Uh, it's great we are here all together for the second lecture on online. Um, I do want to add that you should feel free to interrupt any time just by talking and then we will uh, address those questions. So as I was saying, these are COVID times. So keep your spirits up and help keep other people's spirits up as well, including mine. <laughs> okay, so first thing I want to say is the project presentations. I'm really happy to see you've all submitted, mostly all. So um, we will start preparing a bit uh, for the presentations. I have put down the dates and the times. So I want each of you to contact me uh, with a Zoom uh, invite. And uh, typically in the afternoons, I will be available to discuss each presentation and bring it up to a good level for the uh, big presentation in class. Okay, that's one point. Second thing on uh, Carmen, we have started this discussion forum and I'm hoping all of you can um, join that uh, from time to time. Um, so please, contribute to that so that we can keep make it an active forum because we are not getting enough time to discuss otherwise in class. Okay, so my plan for today, I'm going to start with a recap and then take some questions. So, um, and then after that, I will come to the main idea that I'll discuss today. So let's see, all of you would have probably done the preparatory homework, right? Uh, we yeah. talked about vortices last time, and I asked you to look at these four different vortex configurations around a core. So these were the spin configurations around the core. And if I define this one, which I call a vortex, the first one, the question is, what are A, B, and C? So um, just to get a quick uh, vote, what did people think A is? Anybody? That is neither. 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 Uh, okay. It was an anti vortex. Okay. Um, B, Wait, no, they're, they're all going outwards. Uh, Never mind. Uh -huh. Never mind. Okay, so B is an antibiotic and A and C are both vortices because A and C can both be obtained by uh, globe, uh, global transformation of A, but of the, of the one that you have defined as a vortex, but B can't be obtained by a global transformation of the vortex. Yeah, so uh, what Roy is saying, uh, Shoyantan is saying is correct, and I want you to uh, sort of, let's uh, look at that in a little more detail. So, it also goes back to what Gabe was saying last time about maps from real space to order parameter space. I've tried to show that here. Um, this is real space. This is order parameter space, which is uh, O2, which is just the plane, XY plane, so an angle. And what you want to do is take the real space and map it on this order parameter space. So I have done that for let's say the reference uh, configuration. And you can, I have labeled my sites one, two, three, four, and put them on the order parameter space and it shows you this clockwise winding. So for this convention, clockwise winding is a vortex. And I won't go through that in detail now, but you should try to do that for A, B, C and see what you get. And um, this is, something you should think about and post on the discussion forum if you want to discuss it further. But it turns out A will be winding the same way as the reference, it's a vortex. So also C, but B is winding the opposite way and it's an anti-vortex, okay? So that's an interesting thing. Sometimes by I, it's difficult to tell and you have to do this mapping to get an idea. Okay, great. So um, I think this kind of prep question is a good one. It gets everyone um, into the zone. 
So now let me come for, uh, to the main idea I want to communicate today. Uh, so we are looking at the XY model in two dimensions. This model we are discussing in a magnet context, uh, you know, with spins on sides and cosine uh, of the difference in angle as the interaction. But the same model, I want to just broaden it. It's the same model is valid for superfluids and superconductors. This angle there is the angle of the, or, of the local order parameter. So, uh, or rather, the, so it can be like a local Cooper pairing order parameter, which is complex. Its amplitude and phase are like the spins of the XY model. In a superfluid, it's the local BEC. So like you have a local condensate. And again, its amplitude and phase is like the spin. Okay, so that's the connection. So it's a very, very important topic for a large number of systems. Now, the main thing I want to communicate today is uh, looking again at the critical behavior we started last time for the XY model. We showed that there is um, power law correlations at any finite temperature within spin wave theory. If you include vortices, then that power law ends at a critical temperature called the BKT temperature. And beyond that, the correlations become exponential. Today, what I'm going to show you is that while there is no, in the technical sense, no true long range order, because your correlations never reach a constant, there is something called phase stiffness, which can be used to define a property that is non-zero in the superfluid or in the um, kind of magnetic phase versus the disordered phase. Okay, so the language I will use is this power law correlation is sometimes called quasi long range order, quasi long range order. And that I will just call as a critical phase uh, I might even call it a superfluid or a superconductor or a magnetic phase, but at the back of our mind, we know it doesn't have true long range order. What it will have is phase stiffness, which will be finite all the way up to TKT. It doesn't go to zero continuously as we have seen for usual order parameters. There's a jump at TKT and then it is zero above that. So let me give you a physical idea of what the stiffness is. Um, so if you look at the free, if you take this um, XY model and do a small gradient expansion, you get something like half uh, J, this would have been the bare coupling J, gradient theta square. That's in the Hamiltonian. But now this is what I will show you today. Under RG, the bare, coupling between two spins, which was J, can get renormalized, right? That's the whole idea of RG, that you have an Ising model with a coupling J. Under RG, that coupling gets renormalized. And it's the same thing here, that effective coupling changes under RG. And that is that coupling can be thought of as a stiffness. So what is happening is you have a system with some phase fluctuations there at any temperature. And the stiffness is, a, is an idea of applying a change in the boundary condition. So suppose I have a system of some size and I change the boundary condition. So instead of making it periodic, let's say I make it anti-periodic. So all the spins within the system will try to adjust to that change of boundary conditions and the energy will go up. That energy going up will be proportional to some coefficient that we uh, call the stiffness. Okay, are you getting the idea for the stiffness? It's kind of a rigidity. How rigid are the spins to a change in the boundary conditions? 
Now, clearly, when the system is at higher and higher temperature, there are more fluctuations. So if you now change the boundary condition, it will cost less energy to make, to incorporate that change because already there are so many fluctuations in the system. Hence, the effective stiffness, which is a marker of how hard it was to change the energy will be lower. And that's what you see here. The effective stiffness is going down with temperature. That is very natural. But what is particular about KT transition it, is that it reaches a particular value. Uh, this is J over KT, this K effective, J over KTC. Uh, when it reaches two over pi, there is a jump in the stiffness. So this is what we will derive today using uh, RG ideas. But yeah, I wanted you to have the picture beforehand. Okay, so the conclusion at the end of today's lecture, you will see that uh, for the 2D XY model, there is a line of critical uh, points, critical fixed points with a continuously varying exponent eta. That eta uh, will be related to the stiffness. Eta will be KBT over two pi J. J over KT is the stiffness, effective stiffness. And at the transition, effective stiffness is two over pi. So the pi cancels out and you get eta equal to one quarter. So that's the celebrated result of eta at TC Sometimes I write TC, sometimes I write TK, BTK, BKT, it's the same thing. Uh, it's just a mouthful to say BKT, but you know, we do pay our respects to these three gentlemen who worked on this. So that's a quarter. Okay, so that's, if you get, keep this result in mind, that is the sum total of uh, today's uh, end result. Let me stop here and see if you have any idea type questions. So what exactly is changing boundary condition and connecting that to stiffness? I'm not quite sure about that. Can okay, you... yes, uh, very good. So we will look at some ways of measuring stiffness, okay? And um, the best way I will show you is in a superfluid where you rotate the system. And rotation is like a change of boundary conditions. So I will show you that. Okay, other questions? Do we need to include any higher order terms at some point in the gradient expansion since we're introducing uh, these sort of larger fluctuations? Yeah, so the way this RG works, you remember when we were doing phi fourth theory, we were breaking up phi into slow modes and fast modes. Mm -hmm. The analog here will be spin wave modes and vortices. And the vortices will play the role of the fast modes. So we will integrate out the vortices and that will renormalize the gradient square coefficient k. Is there a threshold for the vortices? Like, because I would think if you can have vortices at, uh, say, smaller and smaller momentum, then you, you wouldn't be able to integrate it out. It'd be like a massless mode. Yeah. So you, I will have to show you some RG for that. Okay. But it will turn out that at the critical point, uh, we will look at the chemical potential for vortices. But the idea will be this. So just to, um, so you will, I will show you that the, uh, vortices will be, um, uh, the chemical potential for vortices will go to zero. The okay. fugacity, more appropriately, fugacity. But okay. I hope everyone is getting the, I am very keen that you get the idea here before the math is going to be quite deep today. So I want you to get the idea very clearly. So just like we had the fast modes and the slow modes, there will be the, any field of uh, thetas can be written as a combination of vortex fields and 
spin wave fields. And the vortices will then renormalize the effective coefficient for the spin waves. That's why I'm not keeping any further terms in final effective theory. Mm. Okay. Okay, good. Any other uh, questions? Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, so for T greater than TC, uh, if the stiffness is zero, does that mean that like the system will change very strongly? Uh, no. It means you can, uh, not strongly, that means if you apply a twist, it doesn't cost any energy. Okay. Um, so and you can see why, because there are so many phase fluctuations, it's very easy, you can just locally incorporate that twist. You see, um, rigidity is a property of long range order, okay? So if you have a magnetic long range order or crystalline long range order, and you try to, so for example, a very good way to understand rigidity is shear modulus in a solid, right? So you take a solid, you know, this also comes to Sandeep's question, how do you apply this external boundary condition? You literally take your, so your solid and you twist it. That's what you're doing in a, in a crystal. You twist it and you're asking how much energy does it cost? Now, clearly, if the solid is at finite temperatures and it's already, uh, you know, oscillate, you know, fluctuating, it costs less energy to put some bend or twist in it. But that is what this rigidity is. Now, okay. here the unusual thing is there is no long range order, but yet there is a stiffness. Okay, so long range order always implies that there is a stiffness. But stiffness does not imply that you will have long range order. And this is the counter example. But when you don't have long range order, like when you have a completely disordered exponentially, um, uh, a phase with exponentially short correlations, then there is no rigidity. Um, and also, so, uh the critical temperature itself, is there just no well-defined stiffness? You have to look at Tc minus. That's why I have Tc minus here, Bkt minus. So at just a little below Tkt, it is two over pi, it's a jump. So a little above it is zero. Okay. Any other questions from, I now see there are 16 participants. Um, sorry, I have a question. Yes. Um, so when we classified the phase transition, we have first order phase transition and second order phase transition, depends on if there's a discontinuous jump on some physical quantities. So what, what order of phase transition is this? So this was the point uh, in the histor history, people started by saying, okay, first order, second order, so on. But this then challenged that. Uh, so this is now just called a continuous phase transition because, um, yeah, it's a line of critical points. So um, but when we say co continuous phase transition, we mean second order phase transition, right? We mean now more than second order. Uh, this would be called kind of... Um, yeah, I think the nomenclature sort of breaks down because if you look at the stiffness, it is making a jump. So that would suggest, ah, it's a first order transition. But really, if you look at the critical behavior of the correlations, that is a power law. That's not what you have in a first order transition. So this is challenging that nomenclature. Okay. So the best way to describe this is it, it is its own class, the KT transition, and it has a line of critical points where the correlation length is infinite at every point. Okay. So yeah, that's a good question, yeah. Okay, more questions? Okay, good. Um, it's do ask any at any point. So let's march on. Uh, that's kind of the plan for today. Um,
I, I found all these Mexican hats in my home and I have um, taken a picture. I didn't know I had such a wonderful collection till I found them from different nooks and crannies. And this will be on the prep. You'll have to figure out which of these are Mexican hats. So let me move on. Yeah, it's fun. You know, when you're caught up at home, you come up with creative things to do. Okay, so uh, this is now a quick recap of last time. And I uh, think this is something you all are familiar with, but I just want to go through it. Uh, so we all get on the same page. So here is the H, beta H with the gradient square. Mm, and now uh, if we want the, so here just the notation, uh, phi is the order parameter and this, sorry, this big phi is the complex order parameter with an amplitude mod big phi, e to the i little phi. So if you want the minimum in the Hamiltonian, you want del square phi to be zero, and that requires phi of r to be m theta plus some constant. So from here, we were able to take the gradient of phi dot dl, integrate along a loop, and get a vorticity m. Uh, and that is how we defined the topological defect of vortex. Then we looked at the energy of the vortex, half j gradient of phi square. And now using this form of, uh, of del phi, we can integrate that two pi r, m over r square. So that's basically dr over r which gives us the log behavior in the energy. So it goes like J, the coefficient. M square is the winding number, but since usually it's, uh, the, we want to keep the energy low, typically we'll make vortices of winding one. And then there's a log L over A. L is the system size and A is the short distance scale. So basically the energy of the vortex just grows with the system size. And that makes sense because your the vortex is not a local object. It is a, it is a very, uh, it basically the, the structure uh, goes all the way to the entire system and hence it scales with L. Now we bring in the entropy and we discussed this, that you can put the core of the vortex on any of the n sites. So that gives a log L over A square. L is the linear dimension. So in 2D scales like L square, and that gives us the free energy, which is pi J minus two. The two comes in from the L square. And this two will be important later. It, it will play into this eta, which was a quarter. So this two will come, will be the important there. So you get pi j minus two kBT log L over A. And that tells us that there is a transition point uh, at, at Tc equal to pi j over two. This is again T kBT if you want of pi j over two. Okay, so below that, when temperatures are smaller, then the energy is the controlling factor. and um, vortices, creation of these vortices are suppressed, but at high temperatures, the free energy becomes negative and it wants to be more and more negative. So there is a proliferation of vortices. And actually, uh, there is a proliferation of vortex anti vortex pairs. So now I discuss this a little more. If you create a vortex and an anti vortex, let's say at two places, zero and R. Um, then you can again do the same calculation. Your, uh, your um, phi of x and y is tan inverse of y over x. And from that, you can get the energy of a vortex anti vortex pair by writing phi of r as this difference in tan inverse, integrating that. And I'm going to let you do this integration but it gives a very natural result, which is that the energy of a vortex and anti-vortex pair goes like log of the distance between them, uh, divided by the microscopic length. 
uh, plus some constant. Okay, so that is a quick recap from last time. And what I want to do next is to uh, move a little bit toward the RG. But before doing that, I just thought I would show you a few experiments to motivate uh, what, how is this um, effective stiffness measured, you know, coming to some of the earlier questions. So this is just uh, some configurations, some vortex, anti-vortex configurations. These are actual simulations that uh, one of my previous students ran uh, because this is a topic I've been quite intimately involved in, not for classical XY models, but quantum XY models. So, but we have been doing such calculations. So you can see that um, as you raise the temperature, blue and orange are vortex anti vortex pairs right here. And you can see that at low temperatures, they are quite close by and bound. So this also comes to Yan Jun's question, what is the distance between a vortex and an anti-vortex? So initially they are very close by because each one creates a disturbance. And by being close by, you kind of remove some of the disturbance. So what I mean by that is, let's see, I have a picture of a vortex and an anti-vortex together. Let me see if I can show this, yeah. You see, this is uh, the field between a vortex and an anti-vortex. And it looks, if you look at it, you would say, aha, this just looks like a dipole. And that's exactly what this problem maps into. It maps into a problem of dipoles. So um, initially, the vortex and anti-vortex are close by, and there are few in number at low temperatures. When I say initially, I mean at low temperatures. At high temperatures, you get more and more vortices and they will be screening this interaction between the dipoles. So this has been a big field of uh, understanding topological defects in the Coulomb gas, which is a problem very closely related to this. Okay, so let me see if I can come to the data. Okay. So one of the experiments where this has been done really beautifully is helium-4. Okay, so helium below a certain temperature is not a normal liquid anymore. It becomes a superfluid. And you remember some time back, we had um, looked at um, that video of superflow in helium. And uh, essentially what the main property of a superfluid is that it has no viscosity. Okay, so now try to imagine what would happen if you have no viscosity. You take an, a torsional oscillator. Okay, so that's like a pendulum. And you, you take this pendulum and you put it in some fluid. So when you oscillate the pendulum, it will drag the fluid along with it. So if it's in the normal state, essentially all the fluid in the bucket will be dragged around the, the bucket. So here is the oscillator, it is rotating and it's dragging the fluid. And when the temperature is above Tc, all the fluid is being dragged around. But when the oscillator goes below Tc, you can think of like a two fluid picture. The total density remains unchanged, but you can break up the total density into rho s, superfluid part, and rho normal, rho n, okay? So while the total remains unchanged, rho s is growing in fraction compared to rho n as you go below Tc. And rho s cannot be dragged along. It has no viscosity. So some of the liquid disengages from the oscillation. The result is because you're conserving your total angular momentum of this oscillator, 
the angular momentum is I times omega. I is the moment of inertia. Omega is your frequency of the total, uh, the, the oscillator and the liquid. But since some of the liquid has disengaged, right, your moment of inertia has gone down. So the frequency must go up. Okay. So, um, so the frequency gets a faster or, yeah. So the frequency gets faster uh, when you go below and from this change in frequency, they can essentially extract the superfluid density. Okay. So that's the main idea. Now let's look at the data. And I'm going to just stop here and make sure everybody. Um, so this is now data not in the 2D system, but 3D helium. So 3D helium is still an XY model, but not in two dimension, it's in three dimensions. So here it is a continuous transition, a continuous or you can call it second order, traditional second order transition with an exponent. So here, what is shown here on the Y axis is the superfluid fraction. So superfluid density uh, in you, relative to the total density. Uh, this is the temperature. And uh, if you were at zero temperature, this fraction would have gone to one. Okay, so let's uh, make sure we understand all our scales here. The temperature here is two point, it's starting at 2.16. But if you kind of extend it all the way to zero, rho S over rho would be one. So all the liquid would be uh, superfluid. Thereafter, as the temperature is raised, rho S is decreasing and in three dimensions, it goes continuously to zero at the so-called lambda transition at 2.17 Kelvin. And look at the quality of the data, right? Some of you have been trying to find data near the critical point. Look how much data they have near the crit to narrow down the critical point and extract this exponent. It's called the zeta exponent, uh, which is close to two third here. And simultaneously on the other side, on the left-hand y-axis is shown the specific heat. And the specific heat here has this very kind of sharp transition. Um, it's called the lambda transition because of the lambda shape of this transition. But that's, this is like amongst the best data you will see for identifying critical behavior. So any questions before I move off this page? Any of the other people? I see there are 18 participants now. Hi guys. Hi. Hi. Is it uh, Hi. logarithm divergence of the heat capacity? Okay. Just wait one slide. I will come to that. Let me go there, in fact. Okay. Um, uh, let's look here. So this was a topic of great debate. Is it a log divergence or what is this behavior? This was a big, a big question in the 60s. And this is one, as I was saying, it's one of the best data near the critical point. You won't believe it, but this, this experiment was taken to space. Because in a lab, many things will cause rounding of the data. So you look at this, the first, this is the same data I showed you before, but you're looking close to T minus T lambda. And then the next one is, so this is within a few degrees of T lambda. T lambda is 2.17 Kelvin. This is now within milli degrees, and now it is within micro degrees. Imagine, that's how closely you're looking near the lambda transition. And you cannot just do that sitting in a lab because various perturbations will round the transition. And if you're trying to figure out what kind of a transition it is at this level of accuracy. So what are we trying to figure out? We are trying to ask, is there a divergence or is there a cusp? 
okay? So in other words, here is the behavior of the specific heat, T minus T lambda over T lambda to the, with some exponent minus alpha. If alpha is positive, it will be a divergence, right? Because there's a minus alpha here. So if alpha is positive, this specific heat should diverge. On the other hand, if alpha is negative, it should, it should be a cusp like this. So you're trying to distinguish a divergence from a cusp, and usually it is easy, except when alpha is very small. It's hard to distinguish. So that was the challenge when this experiment was done. And you can, you can easily see it would be a nightmare to even get such a thing theoretically. So that's when they took this experiment to space because they did not want gravity to be producing any fluctuations even. No rounding due to gravity. So under microgravity conditions, the experiment was done and it was determined that alpha is in fact negative, which means it is a cusp not a divergence. And you can ultimately see that at micro degree resolution, you get that, uh, that cusp behavior. So this is like really beautiful. Okay, but that's the story in three dimensions for the XY model. Any other questions? So, uh... This T lambda corresponds to the T BKT we were talking about before? Uh, so this I said is three dimensions. It does correspond to where the transition happens in the stiffness where, it, where the stiffness goes to zero. Mm. So okay. in 3D, the stiffness actually goes to zero continuously. And that temperature identifies the, the TC. Okay. or T lambda. So I'm sorry, I might have missed, but why, was, there, was there no theoretical prediction whether it's a cusp or a divergence? Um, so I'm actually now forgetting the historical thing of whether it was known at that time. Uh, it's, there's no exact result, right? So okay. you need uh, from the RG, you no, know, sorry. Uh, so, so here's the thing. Um, okay, I have to get back to you on that question, Sandeep. I don't know uh, what was the historical thing of when this experiment was done, what was known. Okay. I have to look so, that up. This kind of question, whether it's a divergence or a cusp, I mean, that could arise in any, any, any models. No, I mean, like, because right, the... right. Yes, that could. Um, the question is, if alpha is big, and positive or big and negative, it's easy to determine. Okay. But when it's very small, you have to, in an RG, you have to go to higher order to get that value. So the okay. calculations become harder. So, you know, this would have been ex obtained within uh, uh, D minus, uh, uh, sorry, four minus D epsilon expansion, like what we did, but for the XY model. Okay, um, now let's look at 2D, okay? So this is now the 2D data, very famous data from Bishop and Repi. Um, this is on helium film, um, again doing the torsional experiment. And you can imagine these are very, very hard experiments because the amount of liquid you have is very small. You know, you just have like a plain worth of liquid. Uh, now, nevertheless, they are able to record the change of the oscillation frequency. So, and they convert it. So let's just think of the y-axis as, um, as superfluid density. So this is two dimensions now as a function of temperature. So now, Saad, coming to your question, this point where you see something sharp in an experiment, it's not going to just jump. There is some small rounding and that rounding is 
So in a simulation, you will see rounding because of finite size effects. Here you see rounding because your experiment is always, you're trying to do the experiment at lower and lower frequencies. It's like trying to extract the static susceptibility. But static doesn't mean omega equal to zero. It's omega tending to zero. And so whatever small omega you are using ends up causing that rounding. And even this was understood later theoretically. But nevertheless, you should think of this place around uh, where the sharpest change is happening as the indication of that jump in the superfluid density. And then the temperature at which it goes away is um, around 1.2 Kelvin. Yes, Jay? So um, even in an experiment, we would have finite size effects, won't we? Because the sample is finite and yeah, yeah. Uh, RG is done for an infinite system. Yes, that is true. But that rounding, given how big these samples are, is not the determining factor here. So yeah, there are, so suppose you were able to, there could be a point where the frequency resolution becomes even very fine and now you are starting to see finite size effects of a sample. So you could, then the finite size will produce the rounding, yeah. So how, um, can I see from these experiments that there's a range of temperatures that are critical? No, not here, because this oh, is okay. just the superfluid density. Remember, the superfluid density doesn't show um, power law behavior. Okay. So let's discuss that. What uh, would you... Mm, go ahead. Uh, oh, so what is the definition of superfluid density? The superfluid density is... So there are several definitions. One definition which I wrote down is the coefficient of the gradient square term. But that is, that is a theoretical... Yes. So in the experiment, the definition that works is you have to look at... A, so I haven't gone into that in my lectures, but the way you do that is by looking at a current current or a velocity velocity. That's the way to say it here because it's a neutral system. So it's a velocity velocity correlation function. Okay, now you can write this velocity field as a transverse and a longitudinal field, just like we were doing for the susceptibilities previously. And the longitudinal velocity correlations is going to give you the total density. The transverse correlations are going to give you uh, the, the superfluid part. So that's why when you rotate, you see, rotation is like a transverse uh, perturbation. That's how you're coupling to the transverse uh, uh, velocity correlations. Is that giving some idea? This also comes to Sandeep's question, how are you going to probe this? Uh, and you know, I the the thing is, the idea is actually much more clear than there's some algebra you have to do, but broadly it is exactly this point that any field you that you have velocity field or gradient of theta that is the velocity. Um, so basically, the, when I say velocity, I mean the gradient of theta that defines a velocity field. And you can write that field in terms of the transverse and longitudinal components and look at its correlations. And the transverse correlations, which is what you pick up when you rotate something, uh, end up giving you the superfluid density. I can put some notes on it. It is, or another place you can look it up is Chaikin and Lubensky does that. Okay, great. So we have some idea about um, this uh, uh, superfluid density, how it is measured, and uh, its behavior in 3D where it continuously goes to zero and its behavior in 2D where there's a jump. Um, you can also measure, just this is an aside, I'm not going to discuss it, but it's an important clue 
that um, when you do the experiment, uh, you can measure the real part and the imaginary part of a response function. This is something which is very general. It comes under the context of Kramer's Kronig relations that connect, um, uh, you know, so you're perturbing a system at some frequency and there will be a response which is in phase and a response which is out of phase. And so one component will give you this behavior for the superfluid density. The other response, which is the dissipative response, tells you, shows this behavior uh, with a big peak at TC. And this comes from the, uh, it, this uh, enhanced dissipation is consistent with vortex anti vortex unbinding at the transition. I'm not going into that right now, but I'm just saying that this was again beautiful data at that time. Okay, so, and again, a lot of very nice theory corroborated all of that. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Um, one, okay, no, I was going to bring up. Uh, one of the things Saad asked about the critical points. So from rho s, you don't see the line of critical points. For that, I was going to ask you guys, suppose it was a magnetic system, what measurement would you do to see that line of critical points? Um, the susceptibility. Uh, sorry, who's that? Hi, uh, uh, so do you measure the susceptibility for the magnetic systems? Yes, you can measure the susceptibility. Um, transverse susceptibility would give this, in this indication. That would be more like measuring uh, rho s or spin stiffness, as you would call it. Mm. Uh, can you just identify yourself? Um, Shantan. Oh, Shantan, okay, sorry. Sometimes I can connect the voice, sometimes not. Um, yeah, but suppose I'm trying to measure order, whether there's long range order or not, what experiment would I do? How about some of the other people who are also joining in? Uh, can I hear from you guys? Hi, Franz, I see you're there. Hi, yeah, I'm here. Do you want to try to answer? I can pick on my own student, can't I? <laughs> can you repeat the question again? Uh huh. Um, so, if you want to measure long range order or lack thereof, what experiment would you do? Mm. Anybody else can also chime in. Well, for a magnetic system, uh, one thing. One signature can be the, the real space correlation function. And so this one, the, the real space correlation is not easy to measure, but you can measure the, uh, for a magnetic system, you can do the, uh, the neutral scattering, which is equivalent to the uh, momentum space correlation function. And then you can see whether it's ex exponential or parallel. So not, not exponential there. So let's go there. So yes. Feng Shi uh, is saying that we can look at neutron scattering, elastic neutron scattering, not inelastic. We are not trying to see any excitations. Elastic is going to tell us about magnetic structure. And if there is long range order, uh, what would you see? Anybody? Uh, so you would see a sharp peak. Yes. You would see a sharp, like crystal structure shows up as Bragg peaks. You would see a sharp peak. What would be the strength of this peak? Anybody? So let's again absolutely be clear that we are looking at a spin spin correlation function at long distances in real space, we all know this spin-spin correlation function has gone to a constant if there is long range order, right? Now you are Fourier transforming this. So your peak at zero momentum, let's say, will be equal to m square. 
the strength, because at long range, the correlation has gone to n square, the magnetization square. When you Fourier transform, this will be a delta function of strength m square. Okay, right? Now here comes the interesting thing. If you raise the temperature, looking at this S of K, this is the dynamical, this is the static structure factor, right? If I had shown you these very sharp spots at K equal to zero, two pi over A, four pi over A, these are the Bragg spot equivalent in the magnetic system. And if I were to ask you what happens at finite temperatures, what would you say? Broadening of the peak. Exactly, that's what you would have said, that you have these sharp delta function peaks, they would broaden. And I want you all to think about this. The answer is it will not broaden. No, so long as you have a constant in the correlation function, right? Your constant value is going down with temperature because your magnetization is going down with temperature. So when you Fourier transform, you continue to get a delta function. Your, your function doesn't broaden. It continues to have a delta function whose strength goes down, but temperature does not broaden those delta functions. Very counterintuitive, but very clear. It's just a Fourier transform property of a function. But you know, we always think, oh yeah, temp temperature always broadens. That's the general thing, but no, not here. So that's something to think about. Now here we are talking about quasi, so you, know, you might have thought, oh, you know what? At zero temperature, I can tell if something has long range order. But at any finite temperature, it'll be broadened. And now I really can't tell if there is long range order. Not correct. Because even at finite temperatures, you will see a delta function if there is long range order. Now comes the point of this KT transition with the line of critical points. So now because the, your correlation function is not going to a constant but has a power law decay, in momentum space also it's a power law. And you can distinguish a delta function from a power law by fitting. So that is how you can detect power law behavior in XY magnets for a range of temperatures. If somebody finds good data on this, and usually Peng Cheng, I look to you as our sole experimentalist in the class. If you find some good data, do let me know. Okay, great. Any other question? Let's take a few minute breather till 10.30 and then we will enter the world of anomalous dimensions. Okay, let's meet in three minutes. Uh, can I ask a question? Certainly. So when we're defining like, so right now we're talking about vortices and it's either like they're centered on a vertex or like we def define them like around a plaquette or something like that. But could we kind of like broaden the definition and say, I start with some random spin configuration and then I pick a block of some like length L by L and then I check the curl along the boundary and if it you know has a curl then i define that as a vortex or something like that yeah that is what i was initially saying that you can take a vort you can take a velocity field and write it as a vortex plus a spin wave you can break it oh, into these components okay. yeah so take a look at Chaikin and lubensky he has a nice formal section on that okay yeah, that's a good place to go for this.
I think one thing to think about as we are pondering right now is what are some things you haven't understood? What sort of questions come to your mind about, oh, this is a concept I didn't understand? Anybody? Um, so I had a question in the regarding the vortices. So, um, um, so uh, since you said that these vortices are topological defects, so like, is there a quantization condition that you can impose on this vortices number? Like we have the DR quantization condition for fluxes and uh, for the quantum Horn effect. Do you have similar kind of quantization condition for the vortices number as well? So this vorticity is, um, the vorticity is an integer. But these are classical vortices right now. Okay. And more generally, uh, coming also to Gabe's question last time about mappings from real space to order parameter space, I put a reference by uh, Merman on our Karman canvas on topological defects and the homotopy theory for that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you can just take a look. It'll cover a lot of other kinds of defects like uh, um, skirmions and so on. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so think about things that you may um, have questions about. When you calculated the entropy for the vortices, it looks like you just counted up the number of lattice sites that you could center them at, but can't you center them on a whole? Um, yeah, it, it's the, it will amount to the same thing. You can, you know, it's the dual lattice of, let me see if I can find a lattice picture here. So either you can put the vortex on a lattice site. So mm -hmm. each lattice site is shared by four neighbors. So effectively, uh, you can either say it's like one, so one lattice site is shared by four neighbors, or you can look at the dual lattice, which is in the hole. So then it's like a, one site. So it'll, the counting will come to the same thing. Whether you, so I, in other words, there will also be N, so like if you look at this structure, right? You may mm -hmm. think, oh, I have many more lattice sites, but mm -hmm. actually they, and only four holes. Yeah. Right? But if you look at the fact that each site is also shared by four um, other neighbors. Um, so I don't know. Is, can somebody say this uh, better than I'm saying it? Um, it just looks like it'd be a factor of two or something because it seems you could count the number of lattice sites and you'd also have the same number of holes that you could put it in. So I think there's a factor of two. Okay, let's, I'm not able to quickly see the, uh, say how, uh, how to get around this, but uh, that's something I will think about. Why don't you guys also think about that question? Yeah, no, because we can't be, um, um, because that factor two is important. Yeah, that would change the BKT temperature. Yes, yes. So that's why let's think about that. Yeah. Okay, good questions. Thank you. Let's uh, move a bit. So now, um, it's things are going to get a little formal, but again, I want to keep our focus on the right things uh, for the purposes of this online class. Uh, because, you know, one of the things is it's hard to convey too much algebra in, a, in this kind of a, a forum. So I'm just going to point you to a couple of um, this particular set of my lectures. Um, the idea here is we are calculating the spin-spin correlation function. That's what we want to do, this G which is the spin-spin correlation function. 
And uh, if you just do dimensional analysis, you will just get something like a mean field behavior that it should go like one over R to the power D minus two. That is what you would just get just from looking at the dimensions of these operators, you know, naively. And I've described this in one of, in some of my notes before. So if you want to go, so that's clearly not the whole story. Um, it comes down to how, when we were doing pi four theory, you remember we were always keeping the coefficient of the delta theta squared term to be half. And we were renormalizing the order parameter in a particular way. So this is actually, uh, we did it in a sort of a seemingly kind of ad hoc way, but it is all part of a much bigger story or much bit bigger formalism called operator product expansion. And uh, it's at the root of something called conformal field theory. Okay, so we are entering some very important kind of mathematics here. And that's what dictates uh, how the correlation will decay. This eta exponent comes from such a discussion. So I'm thinking, I won't go into that in detail here, but I'm just going to tell you the main result. Okay, so the main result is the following. Uh, that, let me see, I can just go to the end, okay. Yeah, so the main result is that, let's say I'm looking at an operator like the spin, okay? So I'm going to look at a spin-spin correlation function. Now, um, the spin couples to a magnetic field. So in an RG flow, you remember there were those uh, RG exponents, YT and YH, which dictated how the relevant directions flowed. So Y here would be the critical exponent of that uh, field, uh, of the RG flow with respect to the field variable. Okay, that's, that's what Y would be. It's the RG eigenvalue of the field conjugate to the spin, which is just the magnetic field. I've written it here in a language that is more general, but basically we are thinking about A being a spin and uh, the field conjugate to the spin is H. Okay, so what this result says is that XA will be a not, uh, an anomalous dimension of operator A. So this is something we will determine. XA plus YA, which we get from the RG, must be equal to D, the dimensionality of space. So this is a result we will prove. And um, even if I don't get to it, these notes try to do precisely that. So what these notes do is basically set up the RG for the correlation function, G, and show you that uh, it will give you ultimately a result like this. That G of R at the critical point is when you rescale your length scales to R over B, B is a scale factor, you get a rescaling here, B to the minus two times XA, that anomalous dimension, and from that, we deduce that just the spin renormalization, S prime, if A was S, then S prime on a different scale, R over B is given by S on the original scale, scaled by this factor B to the XA. Okay, so if you want the proof, I've given it in great detail here. Now, why do we need this? The reason we need this is because of this result here. Um, this is the reason we need it. The spin-spin correlation function uh, will 
turn out because of this theorem that I'm just that I've just proved will go like some constant divided by r to to the power two times the anomalous dimension x s. A has become s because that's the operator, and this we have called d minus two plus eta. So this is a way to relate eta to the anomalous exponent and ultimately the anomalous exponent is related to the RG exponent. So we can get that eta is, oh gosh, this got cut off. Eta is equal to two plus D minus two times YH, the eigenvalue for the field RG. So this is very important because you see, at some level it looks like, oh, we are throwing in so many exponents, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, you know, et cetera. Are they all independent? The answer is no. Only the two relevant ones are important, right? It's the yt for the temperature scaling and yh for the field scaling. So this is able to relate eta to the field uh, scaling eigenvalue. So that's why this is important. Okay, so this is a step now taking us closer to the Rg. So I've kind of uh, not gone into the details here, but I've just come to the result I will need next, which is this connection. Okay, now comes the RG part of it. So we are close to the, we still have about 10 minutes. And um, what I'm going to do here, that was my plan anyway, was not to do the full blown RG because that will take several lectures. And it's in, you remember how long it took us to do the 5 4 theory. We were going lecture after lecture and I had a big anatomy of 5 4 and part one, part two, etc. So it's like that. I've already told you the idea of breaking up into spin waves and vortices and integrating out vortices. Um, now, what I'm going to do here is an inspired. RG, I call it inspired by uh, RG by Ma Michael Fisher. Uh, I learned this from him when he was teaching us RG, you know, back when. But he had run out of time. He was a man who liked to do everything rigorously. And, um, but he had run out of time. So he was faced with either not doing the KT RG or doing it with inspiration. And he chose the inspired way, which I really like because ultimately that's what you can carry in your mind. So let me tell you the key ingredients. You guys read it over the weekend and we will discuss it again some more. So here it is. So the first thing is that the RG comes in two variables. One is the coupling. That of course we know. It's J over KT, just like the Ising case, there's a coupling. But the other variable is the frigacity or you can think of it as um, a chemical potential. You've heard the word fugacity, right? From your stat mech, the strange word, never made any sense, but it's basically the chemical potential for vortices. So it's e to the minus beta, E zero is the core energy of a vortex. So clearly if the core energy is zero, you can just spontaneously make vortices, otherwise there's a cost to making vortices. Okay, so essentially we are going to look at two axes and we are going to look at flows in these two axes. Vertical axis is the fugacity, horizontal axis is K inverse, which is basically the temperature or the coupling, you know, this J over KT. So inverse of that, which is the temperature. Okay, now um, here I'm going to be Little bit, it's not fully rigorous, as I said, some kind of being guided by the result. The, of course, what you would like to do is to kind of go chug, 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 and then get this result, but I'm going to be a little bit in, and that's why I call it an inspired RG. So what we are trying to do, let's just make sure we know what we are trying to do. We want to do a, a, a scaling with some factor B, so our uh, distances R prime is going to be R divided by B. So B is the scale factor. 
And I want to know how do my couplings change with, and B can be written as E to the L, so I can do infinitesimally small scalings. And what I want to know is what is DK DL or DK inverse DL and what is DZ DL? That's the equation I want to get, right? Once you have that, then you guys know how to kind of look at the maps and flows. So that's what you're trying to derive. And usually we do the 5 fourth, et cetera, theory to derive these equations. But here I'm going to just kind of intuitively guess it. So the first thing is, because we have a line of, so let me just tell you the result first. This is what I'm going to prove, not prove, I'm going to suggest that DK inverse DL is, I'm going to do this essentially as a power series perturbatively in, oh no, sorry, this should have been Z. Sorry, I changed notation at some point. So this should have been a perturb perturbation in the fugacity Z and at low temperature. So I'm somewhere here and I'm trying to write these uh, scaling, uh, scaling behavior. So uh, these are the two equations I'm going to derive. DK inverse DL, a power series in Z. Uh, the first term is suppressed because you don't create a single vortices. You create a double, you create a vortex anti vortex pair. So it must go like C, Z square. And the coefficient must be positive because we want that the more vortex anti vortex pairs uh, are created, the more disordered it should be. Meaning your K inverse is like. Um, is K inverse is like temperature. So you are going toward higher temperatures. You're scaling toward higher temperatures. The more vortex anti vortex pairs you have. And that means C0 must be positive. Okay, you might say, well, why don't I have any dependence on K itself? Because that's what we had when we were doing. Um, Ising model, you know, you have a DK DL and there's a dependence on K, which tells you how the relevant and irrelevant flows happen. But here I'm guided by the fact that I have a line of critical points and that can only happen if there is no K dependence on the right-hand side. Now, the important thing is there is no K dependence to any order. So this is an example of a marginal operator to all orders in K, okay? This may be a lot to take in right now, so let me just go on and then I'll stop and we'll continue discussion next time. But this is a crucial ingredient that there's no K dependence um, because of this marginal operator. And DZDL is proportional to Z. The way to see that is actually I should be writing dz square dl is proportional to z square. But when you take, uh, you know, essentially the z square, you can take the derivative and the twos factor out. So if I have a z square, I'll get a 2z dz dl. And from here I have a z square, so one z cancels out. So that's how the DZ DL has a term proportional to Z. Okay, now comes, um, from here you can basically then get to these costellates thaulus recursion relations. And um, what we will do next time is kind of go back and see what was the physics behind it and then map out the flows. So ultimately, this is where we want to get to. So I think it's not a good idea to push such a beautiful result to the very end. And I think um, it's much better that you guys think about it and um, we will discuss what the flows mean and how that uh, line of critical po uh, points uh, becomes the attractor for the flows and so on. So let me stop here and it may be better to take questions. Excuse so I have me. a question. Go ahead. 
Uh, let's see. I heard uh, Yanjun. Yes. Um, so how can you get z equals to zero? I think uh, you define z equals to exponential of minus beta e naught. If z equals to zero, that means e naught goes to infinity. I think it can also just be t equals zero. Uh, no, t is not zero. I'm sitting at some, so if you Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the fugacity is going to zero, you're right. So it's like epsilon naught is going to infinity. So think of it, let's look at, yeah, epsilon naught is going to infinity, which basically means you're not creating any unbound, any vortex anti-vortex pairs. They are bound, okay? So let, let me just, uh, let's just try to look at this picture. So you are, this line here, the dotted green line is the locus of some initial Hamiltonian. You're starting somewhere, okay? Let's say you flow in this way to Z going to zero, which means you're flowing toward um, not having any vortices and anti-vortices. They are bound and that is this phase. In the critical phase, the vortex and anti-vortices are bound up. Mm -hmm. In the okay. other phase here, now they are getting unbound. Yes. So Z going to zero is basically saying creating vortices and anti-vortices is becoming unfavorable. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So, so how do we know that dz squared by dl is proportional to z squared? Um, again, it's a perturbation theory in z. So you're again going, okay, like the lowest order term would be a vortex anti-vortex creation. So dz squared by dl would go like z squared. Yeah. You're writing down just a perturbative uh, expansion and you're just kind of keeping the lowest order term that would typically be there. Now, the <laughs> most rigorous way where you just do the equivalent of five fourth is there in Chaikin and Lubensky. And uh, it may be worth glancing at it before next time. And uh, I can summarize the main idea behind that RG. But the ultimate, result, ultimate consequence of that is to derive, is to motivate, or not, not motivate, is actually to derive these two equations. And what I'm doing here is I'm motivating the result. Okay, yeah, any other questions? So essentially what these flows say is that if you start with from some initial Hamiltonian, you'll flow toward a critical point here. And that critical point um, has, you know, so you, as you can see, because there is no relevant direction, right? What happened in a relevant direction, there were flows outward. In an irrelevant direction, there were flows inward. This is marginal. So uh, this is a marginal operator. And it may be worth thinking about the 5 fourth theory, where also we encountered a marginal operator, but we didn't discuss it very much. OK, any other questions? OK, let me just kind of go back to the summary, I want to make sure you guys take uh, this thing in your minds as you uh, walk out of the door, virtual door. Um, so we are completing 
pretty much um, the discussion of the XY model in two dimensions. Uh, we have found quite unlike a continu continuous phase transition with an order parameter that vanishes at TC, now you have a line of critical points where there is no long range order, but quasi long range order. And that shows up as a power law in the spin-spin correlation function that would be measured by neutron scattering. And that's how from the power law you would know there is no long range order, but it has a finite stiffness. So in response functions, there is something happening. It's like um, the RG we did for the Anderson localization problem. There was no order parameter, but there was a conductance. So superfluid stiffness is a similar quantity, like a response function. It cannot be defined locally. That's the difference. You cannot go in and locally measure um, the stiffness. It is a global property depending on how your system responds to a boundary condition. And that boundary condition response can be measured either by torsional oscillating a liquid or by a transverse susceptibility. And that is finite, decreasing with temperature, reaches a universal value at TC. That universal value is two over pi. So that in fact becomes a way of locating TC. If you don't have a sharp transition in an experiment, all you do is make a horizontal, sorry, make a line with a slope um, of two over pi and wherever it hits your data, let's say you had rounded data. So in an experiment, this in fact becomes a way of identifying TC. You make this line, wherever it hits your data, you call that. TBKT. Okay, so yeah, that's the end. So yeah, thank you very much. If you still have questions, put them on the discussion forum. And thank you all for joining in. Some one person didn't join. There were 19 last time, there are 18 today. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm so delighted you all were able to join and have a lovely weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Stay thank you. Bye. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you. And prepare for thank the you. project presentations. Send me Zoom invites. I want to put the power in your hands to organize a Zoom and invite me to it, and I will help you with, get your presentations looking good. But you need to do that so that everyone's time is, uh, you know, not, it, it's maximally utilized and uh, the presentations are good. Okay. Bye. Bye. Wait, did, Bye. You say, did you say last week that you had two people you were in Zoom twice? So that would be the 19th person. Ah, okay. That could be the mystery person. Yes. Okay. That's my other laptop. Yes, that could be. All right. Well, see you <laughs> later then. Bye. Okay. Bye. Could you spell Jaikin and Lubinsky? I was having trouble finding it. Yes, I will. Uh, it's C H A I K I N. It's on my course webpage. C H A I K I N. It's okay. in the course announcement. I see. Okay, okay. All right, thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. I'm sorry, I have a question. So, what time would be good for you to talk about the project? Uh, I could talk about, uh, like, say, later today, say, around uh, 4 p.m. Okay. Um, okay, I will check with Brad to see okay. if it's available. Cool. Okay, bye. Okay.